Hey everyone, welcome back to the Hardware News Recap for the week. This is a jam-packed episode. We're going to be talking about Intel Alder Lake i3 CPUs, like the 12100, for example, appearing uh, actually in engineering sample form, not just rumors and leaks. The Intel B660 chipset appearing, hopefully bringing down the entry-level price to Alder Lake. We'll also be going over the US FTC attempting to block the NVIDIA ARM acquisition by uh, submitting a lawsuit. The official RTX 2060 were listed, the 3070 16 gigabyte got a listing, and some news on a 6500 XT, but in non-GPU news, there's plenty to talk about as well. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly. Thermal Grizzly's Hydronaut and Cryonaut thermal pastes are high-performing thermal interfaces for use on CPUs and GPUs. You can bring an old card back to peak performance by repasting it and doing preventative maintenance, and Thermal Grizzly's Hydronaut is ideal for water cooling and air cooling for new and old cards alike. Cryonaut Paste is one of the top performing pastes for extreme overclocking with CPUs and GPUs and has been used in several world record scoring machines. Learn more at the link in the description below. First up, some quick GN stuff. We had Brian from BPS Customs out here to help us build a custom PC. You'll see that video on our channel soon. But while he was here, he did the first fully furnished and functioning tour of the GN headquarters. So he'll have a video of how everything's laid out, where all the equipment is, uh, actually around when this video goes up. And right now his spirits could use a little bit of a boost. It would mean the world to him, I'm sure, and to me, if you could go and check his video out, boost that view number, and you'll get to see some of our office at the same time if you're interested in that. We'll link that below. But go check it out. His edits are awesome. It's a hilarious tour, and uh, I enjoyed working with him on it. For a couple of other small items, we have a new Patreon behind the scenes episode if you're interested in that. It's just some internal stuff in the building talking about the server room. Uh, that is on Patreon if you're curious. We also still have the charity drive going for Eden Reforestation Projects. We launched that last week. It's an awesome group to work with where they help employ people who are in need of jobs, and they do so in a way that creates a sustainable or long-lasting job by employing them to plant trees and maintain the forests, which helps restore local economies, local ecosystems, and uh, supports people and plants and animals all at the same time. So great group to work with. We are giving 10% of the GN store revenue to them through December 15th. If you buy anything from our store, then 10% of it will go to them. And then I'm personally going to contribute another 10%. Uh, so that's coming from me for the extra contribution. We actually just had a huge restock of the wireframe mouse mats. If you've wanted one, they've been crazy popular. We got some more in. Those are desk-sized mousing surfaces. They use a high-quality stitched border for anti-fray. They have a custom, unique blue rubber underside. It's actually kind of difficult to get that color rubber, but we've got it in our mat. It has a high-quality print with radiators, CPU coolers, SSDs, You'll see motherboards and RAM and all kinds of other items on there that you'll recognize from PC gaming. We also just restocked our pretty new, actually, red and black mouse pad. That's the charge mouse pad. And we restocked the blue and black component mouse pad, which has a block diagram layout of a motherboard, CPU, chipset, all that stuff on it. The charge mouse pad has uh, sort of almost an isometric view of a GPU where you see the memory, the silicon, some of the caps and the mounting holes and all that stuff because the easiest way to get a GPU right now is on your mouse pad because the real ones are hard to get. But you can at least get ours uh, as a stand-in and as a high-quality mousing service with the custom rubber underside for both of those as well. Check those out on store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to help us out towards the end of the year. Uh, we just opened our fan tester, by the way. That video is probably not up yet, but it will be soon. We'll include a clip here to show you. It sounded scary. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we pun punctured. Okay. So that was chaos, but if you'd like to help us fund our efforts as we work towards learning how to use the fan tester and publishing data, you can go to the store and you'll be supporting Eden Reforestation projects at the same time. Or you can donate to them directly in the link in the description below. And if you order now or this week, especially if you're uh, in North America, there's a great chance you'll get it before Christmas. Uh, obviously, as it gets international, it's harder for us to predict, but there's still a bit of time to get it out the door. Okay, first news item is a wild Intel 12100 appearing. This is from Hong Kong tech media site XFastest, which claims to have an Intel i3 12100 CPU sample. This is one that they show in CPU-Z, accompanied by an LGA 1700 CPU with one of the classic Intel Confidential IHSs that we've seen plenty of here. At this point, Intel hasn't officially published specs, pricing, or other details for the 12100 12400, 
But if rumors are to be believed, the 12400s at least have been circulating in the wild for a couple of weeks now. XFastest puts the price of the 12100 at about $128 USD converted from Hong Kong dollars, and the 12400 at about $192 USD. Although, again, Intel hasn't officially commented on this, so we don't know if these prices represent the MSRP, the usual Intel 1000 unit pricing, which is the tray pricing, or reality. We'll see when they come out. In the very least, these are in the same spot, roughly, as the 10100 and 10400 from effectively the previous generation, because we should all forget the 11th gen existed, which were around $120 and $180 at launch, respectively. According to XFastest, the 12400 will be a 6-core CPU, presumably 12-thread, though it's not explicitly stated, and the 12100 will have 4 cores and 8 threads. The 12100 allegedly won't take advantage of the P-Core and E-Core technology we've seen on older like CPUs thus far. And the 12100 has a 12 megabyte cache, according to XFastest, with a 60 watt TDP. The media outlet also said the highest single core clock that it saw was 4300 megahertz, which marks it predictably lower than all of the other Alder Lake CPUs out now, including the i5-12600K. Really not a surprise. Uh, XFast has tested the 12100 against Andy's most recent budget considerations. That would be the R33300X and the R33100 uh, non-X, and you can check the benchmarks on their website. But in nearly every test that they ran, the 12100 bested the AMD CPUs with the 3300X following close behind or matching in many of them and beating the 12100 in a handful of them. Honestly, the biggest takeaway here is just how disappointing it is at the low end right now, where AMD functionally abandoned it over a year ago now when the R3 CPUs launched. They haven't come back for it. Uh, the lowest CPU being made actively and sold actively by AMD in any meaningful volume is the R5-5600X, which is closer to $300. So sub 300, it's kind of barren right now from both Intel and AMD, unless you're buying maybe the 10 series or whatever you call the 11 series. It's not a generation, but uh, the 11 series, we suppose. So needless to say, we're interested in the 12100 and the 12400, especially because they might mark a return to the low end with CPUs that are actually gameable uh, and competitive if they follow the rest of all their like, which was a genuinely exciting launch with actually good products coming out of it. It's rare this year. So we were happy to see that and hopefully the i3s or the low-end i5s like 12.4 will follow suit and hopefully also kick AMD in the ass a bit to start competing with Intel again at the low end. All right, Intel B660 chipset appearing and other low-end non-Z chipsets. The biggest problem with the Alder Lake launch, except for Windows 11, just generally sort of existing, the biggest other problem was the entry price, where, as usual, you get the high-end CPUs, the high-end product launching first. The cheapest CPU was uh, still close to the $300 mark, $260 for the 1K unit price on the 12600KF, and the cheapest motherboards are approaching $200. Maybe $180, you can start to get a cheap-ish Z690 board, but there was a day when $180 was a pretty high-end board for most users, and 120 to 150 was sort of the more reasonable mid-range enthusiast spot, and that doesn't exist now. So hopefully the new chipsets will uh, bring some of that back. Luckily, the eagle-eyed Momo underscore US, who is an avid leaker, has spotted new options on the horizon. In an unsourced Twitter upload, the watermark is his own, he lists specs for the upcoming H670, B660, and H610 motherboards. We won't go through a breakdown of all the USB and PCIe lanes available on each chipset, and you can see them on the screen uh, in the image if you're interested. But the most significant takeaway is that all the boards will support DDR5 and DDR4, enabled at a CPU level by Alder Lake. Remember, of course, that you won't get both DDR4 and 5 on the same motherboard unless one or the other is toggled, but you'll never get them at the same time with these CPUs. Uh, it is, however, an option. DDR4 remains obviously cheaper than D5. Like the 500 series boards, the H670 and B660 boards will support memory overclocking, but not CPU overclocking. That is reserved for Z690. The H610 doesn't support either option. No word yet on when the H670, B660, or H610 will be available, but with CES, digital or otherwise, around the corner, it's safe to assume we'll have more information in early January, likely the first week. These boards will be significant if they can move the entry price point to a span more than a range of $180 and up. Hopefully we see some stuff at the 100 or even sub 100 mark. Up next, the US Federal Trade Commission has slapped Nvidia with a lawsuit over the $40 billion acquisition of ARM that's 
been in the news basically nonstop for the last year and a half. This really shouldn't surprise anybody. Uh, this enters potential antitrust territory, which is sort of where the FTC is operating, and ARM's owner, which is SoftBank, the one looking to offload ARM for a huge sum of money, is the one that's named in the lawsuit. We reported that the deal had stalled as far back as January, where at the time the FTC was working on building its case to present the potential lawsuit. The EU intervened in October, and agencies in China and the UK are working on following up based on the reporting we've seen the last few months. In the official complaint, the FTC stated that, quote, the proposed acquisition will substantially lessen competition in multiple markets because it will create a combined firm that has both the ability and the incentive to use its control of ARM to diminish competition by undermining NVIDIA's rivals. It then goes on to call ARM as it exists currently, quote, the Switzerland of the semiconductor industry because of its status as a fabulous company that licenses IP neutrally. The document also contains multiple redacted quotes from ARM employees and NVIDIA insiders, quote, highlighting the basic conflicts of interest associated with NVIDIA buying ARM. An evidentiary hearing is scheduled for August 9th, assuming that the respondents, that'd be NVIDIA, SoftBank, and ARM, contest the complaint, which they will. They'll be back, and in greater numbers. Uh, NVIDIA stated that as we move into this next step in the FCC process, we will continue to work to demonstrate that this transaction benefits the industry and promotes, sorry, I can, can say that without laughing for some reason, and promotes competition. That's right. Buying your biggest rivals is a good way to promote competition. Don't really know where to go from there, but that's what it is. It's good to know, though, that NVIDIA is willing to just drop $40 billion to help its competitors, and we're looking forward to see what comes out of it. We don't know how many refreshes it takes to get to the center of an old GPU, but it's becoming a lot. The RTX 2060 is giving the GT730 a run for its money here. The fabled 12 gigabyte 2060 that literally maybe one person has probably been asking for has now stepped forward spotted by momomo underscore us. Now we've already talked about this, but at this point it's official. The 12 gigabyte 2060 is now an Nvidia thing, not just sort of a rumored thing. Additionally, there are some other disclosures featuring the 16 gigabyte 3070s in the future and 12 gigabyte 3080s. Amusingly, Gigabyte even goes as far as to brand the 12 gigabyte 3080 and the 16 gigabyte 3070 as quote, gaming GPUs. Despite the fact that the extra memory makes all of these things likely more valuable to miners, than it does to people gaming. The RX 6500 XT also appears on the list. Just a reminder that that doesn't exist yet, nor does the 3050, also in leaks this past week or two. Uh, they've been appearing lately. These would be low-end options if NVIDIA and AMD ever feel compelled to offer something when they can sell literally everything they make at the higher end and probably make more money from it, uh, especially with limited silicon and wafer supply, obviously. They can only get so much from their suppliers, so. Uh, anyway, they were named the 6500 XT and the 3050 exist somewhere in a lab. When they come to the market, we don't know. Thus far, listings for the 2060 12 gigabyte have appeared via Zotac, Gigabyte, and Gainward websites, confirming that it's not just a Russian hacker who has put together a 12 gigabyte 2060, and that's an actual story. If you missed it, check out last week's news episode. Up next, despite shortages, the GPU market is extremely healthy right now in terms of overall sales, although it could sell more. John Petty Research's latest add in board report showed a 25.7% surge in quarter three shipments, that's year over year, and that reaches 12.7 million units and $13.7 billion of add in board video cards. Obviously, even that quantity hasn't been enough to keep pace with demand, as a quick glance at Newegg or eBay really proves. The public summary of the report makes no distinction either between units sold to individual customers versus businesses and mining farms, and also it's unable to differentiate between bots or professional scalpers, at least as opposed to normal consumers. 37 million discrete video cards were shipped in the first three quarters of this year. That is on track to exceed last year's total, 42 million for the entire year. Other interesting notes from the report include a 1% bounce back for AMD's market share and some positive speculation about Intel's planned entrance to the market in quarter one of 2022. JPR reports often include IGPs in these market share distributions. In this one, it doesn't. So it's only looking at actual discrete video cards. That means Intel's IGPs don't give it a 
massive boost that would otherwise seem unreasonable to people who actually use video cards or who's ever tried Intel's IGP. Up next, there's a crypto hijacking virus or piece of malware that's being spread through illegitimate Windows key software and Microsoft Office key software. Users looking for an easy way to technically illegally activate Windows or Microsoft Office products might be paying for those activation keys after all. And that's going to be through crypto wallets getting compromised or potentially emptied. Red Canary is a cybersecurity company that recently outlined how fraudulent versions of a key server program, that'd be KMS Pico, were carrying a CryptBot payload that was designed to steal credentials. KMS Pico is a tool used to activate Windows and the Microsoft Office suite without actually purchasing the real thing. The name KMS came from Windows Key Management Services, which helps enterprises manage bulk licensing. Normally, a KMS server works with client PCs to validate licenses. KMS Pico runs on the downloader system, and it acts like a KMS server so that Windows and MS Office can activate without a license. Red Canary showed that on infected systems using the fraudulent version or the, the fraudulent version of the fraudulent software KMS Pico uh, had CryptBot malware that was capable of lifting information from a variety of crypto wallets uh, and potentially hard wallets as well. They named Atomic. Coinami, Jax, Electron Cash, Electrum, Exodus, uh, Multi-Bit HD, web browsers were named, so Chrome, Firefox, Opera, and others, and hardware wallets like Ledger were listed as well in the Red Canary write-up. But hey, at least Microsoft's not getting your money, right? Alder Lake was a big win for Intel overall, but as we experienced in our review process, not every game would work successfully on Alder Lake, especially with Windows 10, although Windows 11 also had issues. This mostly boiled down to Denuvo uh, DRM, Digital Rights Management Software. It is probably one of the most hated pieces of software related to gaming on the planet, and you've likely heard of it before. But in this particular instance, Intel was trying extremely hard not to name Denuvo in its report because that would hurt their feelings. Instead, Intel worked with the company to rework the software or the games or something to get it to work on Alder Lake. The core of the problem, though, was that Denuvo was identifying incorrectly the e-cores on Intel's Alder Lake CPUs as a secondary system. It thought that was suspicious, and so that's why certain games were non-functional. Now, these problems have mostly been fixed at this point, where uh, Intel now only names three games that are incapable of running on Alder Lake without using one of the hackiest workarounds we've ever seen, wherein there's a BIOS update where you toggle a legacy game mode. It's a hell of a name for something that's a DRM problem, but OK. Uh, and then you push scroll lock, and then everything magically works. But short of using that workaround, the issue remains on three of the games right now. And uh, this is something that we're a little concerned will become a problem for future games preservation, where uh, Developers don't stick around to patch games eternally, and they don't. Things might break as CPUs advance and come out like this if they have some old DRM that doesn't understand new technology on them. But either way, the games listed that are affected today, cut down from 49 originally, are now just limited to Assassin's Creed Valhalla, probably the biggest to name here, Madden 22, and the extremely popular and also extremely German-sounding Fernbus Simulator, which we assume is probably Der Bauer's favorite game. This shows the daily life of a coach driver on the German Autobahn. And uh, if you've recently flashed BIOS or enabled legacy game mode, you'll still be able to play it by pushing scroll lock. However, if you really want the true experience, you'll need to wait for Intel to work with Denuvo to patch it so that Fernbus Simulator works properly on Alder Lake, as it should. And you probably do want to play that game. It, it definitely sounds awesome. Their bear probably uses it to map out his routes for smuggling thermal paste across borders. The Stop Grinch Bots Act. That's right. U.S. policymakers are back doing their best to understand the internet. Uh, they're already reintroducing a previously failed bill to make online scalping more difficult. This is actually one we'd be really curious to see your comments on below. Uh, let us know what your thoughts are on this bill. We will not be providing any of our team's thoughts on whether it's a step in the right direction, a step in the wrong direction, useful or not useful. But this is an act that was originally introduced in 2019. Uh, it failed at the time. It's come back, though, and the reintroduction has coincided with the year end of uh, holiday shopping, as it would typically coincide. MSRP graphics cards are, of course, 
nowhere to be found, although we don't expect the policymakers to really know what those things are. So they're looking at probably the bigger picture, which is that lots of things are being scalped, not just consumer video cards, PlayStations, for example, and Xboxes. Certainly those are words that people have heard before. With the general public being more irritated than ever at scalping, the bill might stand more of a chance at passing this time. And what it's supposed to do is prohibit uh, so-called bad actors from using bots to circumvent the standard security measures. So things like clicking uh, I'm not a bot or identifying bicycles, which is one of the most infuriating things I've ever had to do to purchase a motherboard. Thank you, Newegg. Missed the opportunity because I that one was a scooter, but I guess the algorithm decided it was a bicycle. And that was that was the wrong choice on my end. So opportunity lost. Anyway, this is all easier said than done. If passed, this bill would make it illegal under the FTC Act to knowingly use bots to get around security for purchasing and then further make it illegal to sell or offer to sell any product or service obtained in this manner. This is, of course, describing scalping at this point. So it goes from being a personal use bot to being uh, a, maybe a criminal quantity of products. Not really sure how you'd define it, but either way, uh, the last point of this bill allows the FTC and the state attorneys general to treat bot workarounds as prohibited, unfair, or deceptive acts or practices, uh, and then take legal action against scalpers and the users of the bot. So this is where we're curious what you think. Leave a comment below if you think this is uh, helpful, not helpful, right direction, wrong direction, we haven't really talked internally too much or developed opinions on this yet and genuinely want to read what you all think because this is kind of a, a new direction or a new topic for legislators to have to deal with outside of maybe ticket scalping. That's been around a long time and there is legislation about that. So uh, it's maybe an extension of some stuff that's already been at combat before on a wider stage than what we typically see for consumer electronics. Finally, the Apple M1 Max. Now these are rumors, it's speculation based on some block diagrams out there. We've already seen AMD, of course, adopt the chiplet approach with Ryzen. They've been extremely successful with it. Intel has gone that direction with its 3D packaging and with Favros as well. And Nvidia, a couple of years ago now, released its own white papers on MCM or multi-chip module GPUs. So this seems to be sort of the direction of the future for silicon makes sense. Apple's new M1 Max chips appear, based on what we know today, to have a section on the edge that may be an MCM or a multi-chip module interconnect. Now, none of this has been substantiated by Apple yet, but two and four die interconnects are the sort of theory right now. A design incorporating four dies would make a monster 40 CPU core and 128 GPU core processor. And the current M1 Max processors are manufactured using TSMC's five nanometer process and contain 10 CPU cores and either 24 or 32 GPU cores, just for perspective. Memory addressability would allegedly go from 64 gigabytes to 128 gigabytes, and a doubling of memory bandwidth is also included in the theories right now at 800 gigabits per second maximally. The question of extra silicon dedicated to an I.O. die has also been raised at this point, and solutions like AMD's Infinity Fabric have been offered as possibilities. And we'll keep an eye on the progression of Apple's M1 architecture. It's becoming interesting to us. We don't really cover Apple, but this is something that is it's sort of entering territory that we're skilled in, we're good at. So uh, we may end up benchmarking some of that stuff in the future. But that's it for this one. Thank you for watching. As always, subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersaccess.net if you'd like to grab one of our mouse mats, mouse pads, mod mats, which are about to be in stock, by the way. So grab one if you want it. It'll ship in the next few weeks. Or toolkits, which are on back order. Uh, you can also go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus, where we've posted a couple of behind-the-scenes videos recently from the building. Thank you for watching. We'll see you all next time.